So good morning from the UK and good evening in New Zealand to Vicky. This is Caroline Tapkin here on behalf of Travel Daily Inspiring Women in Travel Asia. Um, and we're talking today to Vicky Paris, who is, let me get this right, VP Customer Success for FCM Travel Solutions Asia, normally based in Singapore, but currently tuning in from New Zealand. So thank you for staying up late, Vicky. And welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and your role currently? Sure. Thanks, Caroline. And it's an absolute pleasure to be in this interview with you. Um, so my role, you got it exactly right. So my role is VP of Customer Success for FCM Asia. And um, I am based in Singapore normally. Um, I've been in Singapore for the past five years um, with FCM. I was in India for three years prior to that, but we might get to that a little bit further on. Um, my current role though is, um, so I sit as part of the executive leadership team for FCM in Asia. Um, and that helps us to drive the direction of the business, make sure that we're hitting um, our growth targets and looking after our customers well, and also kind of setting a strategy for um, FCM in, in our region. Um, and I look after the different teams and departments that take care of all of those touch points that we have with our clients throughout our partnership. So um, our implementation teams that onboard our clients um, onto FCM, including um, the integration of our systems and technology, and then our operational service delivery teams that look after our clients day in and day out, and the account management teams and functions as well. Um, so my role is really making sure that we have successful partnerships with our clients um, for at least the first term of contract and hopefully the further contracts that we engage with them in down the, down the road. That's quite a responsibility there. And that covers Asia for you, doesn't it? How did you get to where you are? Where did it all start? Oh, it's a long road, Caroline. Um, it's shortened a, I've been version. A shortened <laughs> version. So I've been with the company for 15 years. Really short version, I'd, I'd been living and traveling overseas for a number of years. I returned to New Zealand where I'm from originally um, and looked to settle down. Um, my daughter was five at the time, ready to start school. And I had a few ideas about what I wanted to do, um, but I really just wanted to get settled in and with a job, get my feet on the ground and give myself a little bit of time. Um, flight centre were advertising. Um, I applied for a role as a travel consultant, had never done that before, um, was successful, started in as a travel consultant um, and really honestly thought I'll, I'll do this role for maybe six months and give myself a little bit of time while I decide the direction that I want to go in with my career from here. And um, I, what I didn't kind of anticipate was just how much my love of travel, which I'd been doing extensively, and my love of people and their stories would just blend together so well in the travel environment and industry. And I just loved my job so much when I started it. Um, and then opportunities just opened to me really quickly. Um, I progressed into leadership roles really quickly from there. Um, into leading my own business and then I became a regional manager looking after around 25 different businesses um, for the company across the North Island um, and then I took the role of a brand leader for the brand um, in India and relocated there where I was based for three years to reset the brand um, to really work successfully within the environment of India. Okay, that um, India must have been quite a challenge. Um, it was definitely a challenge. Look, you know, I, I think it was the most formative part of my career to date. Um, you know, I'd backpacked through India years ago um, for, for a couple of months when I was traveling, when I was young. Moving there professionally and, and working there in business was a completely different experience, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but you know, it was incredible. The people and the teams that I got to work with there um, were simply amazing. And the environment that I walked into, um, which was very kind of hierarchical from there, three years later, the time that I left um, was just the teams that I worked with. It was just a very, uh, a very different place three years later. Um, in the relationships that I had with people and seeing how open they were to contribute and have their voices heard and really make a difference in the business. Um, 
it was a really exciting time for me. Uh, so uh, it was also very challenging in a number of ways um, being in that environment. And there were times that I definitely had to uh, speak loudly to have my, my voice heard. Um, uh, it, there were not um, many women at all in the leadership team and um, very few women. There were only two of us in the senior leadership team in the business. Um, so a big part of my role there that I took on outside of growing the business was also working and encouraging the women that were in the business to, to really work hard and focus on the areas that they wanted to move into and try and get more women within the leadership team in that environment as well. So I, mean, I spent three years in India. Of, sorry, that yeah. takes a great deal of, of self-confidence um, to walk into a role like that and to stand up and be counted. So who had your back? Um, so I moved there with my family. It did take, it took a lot of confidence, but you know, I've always been extremely adventurous. Um, and, you know, I think that stemmed from my grandmother who, who instilled a sense of adventure in me from a very young age, particularly when it came to travel. She was an intrepid traveler herself. Um, so, you know, in truth, if I'd possibly thought too long about it, I might have scared myself away <laughs> from taking the role. Um, I really jumped into it, you know, and, you know, I, 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 I showed some interest before I knew it. I was there. I was interviewing for the role, and you know, I was I was appointed the role before I had really a moment to think too much about it. Um, but it, you know, I was at that point in my career as well where I was really looking for something different to be challenged by, and an area where I felt I could make a difference. Um, and and that was definitely both of those things. Um, so I had recently just got married um, as well. So. Um, we moved there um, the week after we were married, so with my husband and my daughter at that stage was um, 13, turning 14 years old, so she was just about to start high school. Um, so she started her, her um, high schooling at an international school in India. And when you say who had my back, um, I think I had, you know, I had really good support of my colleagues that I'd been working with in New Zealand, who I stayed in really close contact with. Um, I formed a couple of close allies on the ground really quickly as far as colleagues go as well. Um, but also my husband and my daughter were incredible and they were really my cheerleaders on the ground to make sure that, you know, if times it became challenging, they helped to reinstall my confidence and also reset my priorities mm -hmm. about what was really important and not to get too caught up in things and give myself a bit of a break and take a breath and, you know, remember that we're there to together as well and, and not to um, get too caught up in the stress of it all. You said that's probably one of the most formative times of your career. Mm. What what stands out as making it the most formative? So I think I've never been one to shy away from things when they get difficult, but I think in that environment was probably the most challenging work environment that I've been in. Um, not so much within the company itself but probably outside of that and you know India is a you know it's it it holds so much beauty as a country but it also holds so much in the ways of challenge um, and there's a, a book that a friend gave me once um, when I when I let her know that I was moving to India and it has a line in there that says mother India she'll hug you one day and punch you in the face the next and that's very much how how it felt being there and in that environment and working in that environment and I think career-wise it was formative because I really had to reach um, above what I thought I was capable of doing and what I thought um, what I thought I, I could really do, not only in making the decisions that I had to make at times, um, but also just not giving up when, when things seemed really hard on the business front, when it seemed really difficult to try and grow a, a business or get it right for that environment. Um, I, I just had to dig in really deeply and I had to uh, probably become a little bit more um, 
I guess humble. I've, I've been a leader in New Zealand for some time in the business where I'd done quite well and really enjoyed what I was doing. And I found when I went to India, I had to have a high level of confidence, but I also had to just humble myself and ask a lot of questions. I had to be extremely curious and really get to know what it was that was going to work rather than just go in there with this mindset of, I know what I need to do. Because going in with that showed me that I was going to fail really quickly. And I was never somebody that liked to fail very much. So I had to humble myself. I had to ask a lot of questions. I had to listen a lot. And then I had to make decisions um, quite quickly to move things in the right direction. Um, so all of those things were challenging to me as a, a relatively still young leader at that time, even though I'd been leading in New Zealand, it's a very different environment. And only when you expose yourself to a different culture and a different way of doing things and different mindsets, I think, does your leadership style really get challenged. Um, and so formative, because I think I became a very different leader from the time I entered that environment to the time I left. Um, how really did you ways. develop those leadership skills? Because we're not born with them. Um, we're not born with them. Although I think, to be fair, from a young age, I, you know, I grew up with a very, uh, I mentioned my adventurous grandmother, a very entrepreneurial mother who, who grew, you know, three different businesses, um, you know, as I was growing up successfully, and I got to watch her do that. Um, I also grew up in a very large family, so I was, uh, I had one sibling, two parents, but then my parents adopted five other children as I was growing up, and so I think growing up, you, you, ha you have the chance, I think everyone has the chance to learn different leadership skills, whether you take them on or not, depends on your own, I guess, makeup, but I think from a young age, I learned to lead, not necessarily as a, as a bullish out front leader, but in my own quiet way as a child when I was growing up. And then um, I think when I started my career in travel, other people saw my leadership ability more than I did in myself. And I was very lucky in the fact that I had people around me, one particular leader who was running the HR and PeopleWorks function at the time, um, who really kind of took me aside, her name was Sue Manson, and encouraged me to really recognize the leadership capabilities that I had. And she put me early through some senior leadership training um, and got me ready to take on senior leadership positions. And at that stage, I hadn't really seen that in myself just yet. So it takes somebody else really to bring it out of you so you can recognize it. Um, if we fast forward a little bit, so your role now is leading the team in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned when we were talking before we started recording this, that you have many women in leadership roles throughout Asia. So how, how has that come about and how do you nurture the growth of the, the women in the organization? Um, so I think a big part of that for me is well, it's a couple of things. One is being accessible and trying to be highly accessible. Um, we're a very non-hierarchical organization anyway, which is one of the reasons I think I've been here for so long and I really enjoy being part of the company culture. So being accessible and being making sure that the women that I work with or everyone that I work with, but in particular, the women have um, feel that they can come to me and, and kind of talk through anything that they need to talk through if they're questioning kind of the direction that they're going with in their career or just a decision that they're trying to make on the day about things. If they need a kind of a, uh, a, a sounding board, then I try and be that as much as I can. Um, and I try, I think I used to be the type of leader that would give answers and I've grown into the type of leader that will help encourage them to come up with their own answers that's going to work for them um, instead, which hopefully encourages them to, to be better in their own leadership and do the same. So I think being accessible, and I think the other really big thing is just listening and, and caring and showing that as a leader, you can be those things. Um, I think often, especially when I grew up in leadership, I felt that I had to kind of work harder, push harder, be a little bit louder or more firm in my positions on things and my decisions. Um, and I think over time, I learned that actually you can lead and be a little bit softer 
um, and you can still have a very caring nature and still be a very good leader. In fact, it's really important that you have that as well and you can still make the hard business decisions, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, so I try and take time, be really accessible with the girls that I work with, but also um, to listen um, when they come to me as well. Um, and then uh, really just make sure that um, like somebody did for me when I was a young leader, make sure that they're aware of the skills that they carry and make sure that they are aware of the strength that they have in their own um, skill set or if they are emerging leaders within the leadership capacity that they have now. Um, because sometimes you can lose track of those very easily. And I find that that happens a lot. And in particular, um, in Asia and in the teams that I work with, um, it's not easy for women to always put themselves forward for things and to recognize that they've got the skill set or the strengths to go for a position or apply for a leadership position. Um, so for me, it's helping them see the strengths that they have and also identify the gaps and then work through a bit of a plan with them on what they can do to bridge those gaps if that's what they want to do. Um, and get them ready to feel confident in putting themselves forward for things because, you know, the best role should always go to the best candidate, regardless of gender, in my mind. But we just need more women putting themselves forward in the first place to make sure that there is a really good mix of candidates to choose from. It's a very female trait, isn't it, to not recognise the skills that we have. I mean, you, you use a lot of coaching dare I say it coaching terminology and, and things there and you mentioned in your LinkedIn profile NLP and meta coaching how much is mm. when did you take up those skills and how much of um, those skills have impacted your leadership style now yeah a lot um, so I was first introduced to it was the coaching room in uh, Australia based out of Sydney that we did something with through work as a leadership team um, that was around four years ago and it was a workshop for a couple of days that I found incredibly eye-opening and empowering for myself and it was the first time that I probably really started to look more inwards in my leadership and up until that point as well as very much you know I would get very stressed about things because I was very focused on how I was seen as a leader rather than how I was being as a leader authentically as myself. So when I started to see that and I started to recognize that in myself, I just became incredibly curious and thirsty to understand more. So then under my own um, capacity, I started studying more with the coaching room and going and doing training when I could with them in Sydney um, from Singapore. So I did um, NLP training through to the master practitioner and then I went on to do the coaching training with them and the meta coaching training and I really did it first and foremost for myself because I wanted to become a better leader and just have a lot more self-awareness of how I was moving through you know my own life and my career and impacting the people around me and then I recognized that actually it had you know a really a, a lot of skill sets that would be really beneficial to my role as well so then I got to bring them in there and you know just circling back to what you said earlier um, you know one of the first things I learned was how much I was discounting myself and my own uh, skills and my own strengths and when I started recognizing that in myself I started recognizing it a lot in the woman that I worked with as well and sometimes it's just bringing awareness to that in the languaging that we use and how often it happens and as soon as we become aware of it then it, it helps us to stop doing it it's a great skill to have isn't it because it yeah it's it's part of leadership and leadership roles leadership approach has changed over the years so are you seeing more of this sort of coaching approach in your environment and, and in Asia than the old style of do what I say and follow? Definitely. I, look, I think that in all environments, actually, but we are, you know, well, I'm seeing that a lot more in Asia as well. And, you know, I think most companies today are looking for um, a really high level of um, emotional intelligence when it comes to leaders. 
Um, and I think that that's absolutely key because at the end of the day, you know, and and there's a lot of great speakers out there. Simon Sinek's one of them who talks about the why. And if we aren't getting our people and our teams um, buying into the reasons why we're trying to do things as an organization, what the meaning is behind the things that we're trying to do, then we don't have invested people. We don't have people that are bought into our goals and our vision that really don't enjoy coming to work every day. And the difference that you have in a team that is invested in what they're doing, that is invested in the vision and being part of the organization compared to one that doesn't, it's just, it's incomparable. And the results that you get from an invested organization um, versus one that's not is, is incredible. So. I think we're seeing more of that coaching, mentoring capacity in companies today. I think that they're putting a lot of full-time roles into place. I have friends that are full-time coaches in companies, and that's all they do is coach the leadership suite or the emerging leaders within that company. Um, and I think it's being recognized more and more that um, it is a really good way for companies to grow in a, in a sustainable way that's also building a good succession plan of leaders. Um, and it's something that we probably haven't done enough of in the past. So it's, it's a really positive thing, I think. Looking back over your career, what you know now, what advice would you give to your younger self starting out? Um, advice to my younger self. Probably I uh, trust myself, probably, in, and I'd probably say that to, to any young girls today, I've certainly said it to my own daughter many times, um, is, is really just to, to listen and trust yourself. Um, I think um, when I was young, I, I sought a lot of feedback. And again, it was about how I was being seen rather than, you know, how I was moving through the world um, myself. So I think self-trust is really, really important. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you know, I love about what I did when I was young and I've done throughout my career is also just saying yes to the opportunities that have come my way, even the ones that I was, you know, didn't know I was capable of doing or was maybe a little bit scared of was really just embracing opportunities when they came to me. Um, and so I'd probably say to myself, well done, good, you know, that, that was awesome that you did that and you didn't hold yourself back because you were scared. Um, but probably just that trust yourself a little bit more. Really, what you think of yourself and your own feedback is always going to be 10 times more important than what someone else thinks. Um, so I probably would have given a bit of that advice. Um, and yeah, probably don't discount a career and travel because it's the thing that's going to bring you the most joy. Um, and I would never have known that when I was young. I would never have seen myself heading into a career in the travel industry. And honestly, Caroline, I've, you know, in the 15 years that I've been in this industry for all of the ups and downs, um, there's not a single day that I've wished I was anywhere else. Um, and that might sound strange given the environment we've been in for the last 18 months. Um, but I feel incredibly privileged to be part of an industry that stands for something that I've always been so excited about and moved by. And, you know, starting off in the, in the leisure business where you get to send people to different places to meet people and, and hear their stories of, of why they were traveling, the purpose of their travel and what happened from their travel, um, to now being in the corporate industry where, you know, it's so much more about things like duty of care and making sure that people have everything that they need to travel seamlessly so they can focus on the reason that they're traveling and not have to worry about the, the things that are happening around them with travel. Um, you know, there's so much, there's so many different dynamics to it, but it's still at the end of the day, it's travel. It's something that people are incredibly passionate about regardless of the purpose. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited. This is where I've ended up. I never would have seen it as a young woman. The one thing that stands out from everybody I've been interviewing in travel is the passion for travel. Mm -hmm. um, and many people have come to it tentatively. Um, as you said, took a job, didn't know what was going to happen, and you've ended up there 15 years later. Uh, yeah. But it is that passion that comes through from everybody. So what, what's next for Vicky? What comes next? Oh. It's a great question. What's next? Um, you know, one of the things that I've really loved over the last couple of years in my role is how much 
travel is changing and in particular the corporate travel environment is changing and um, it is so much more now driven through technology and solutions via technology and really blending the best of technology and that person-to-person -person experience and you know what technology is not something that you know really interested me greatly when I was younger or growing up um, so um, what's next? I'm really enjoying learning different aspects of the business. Um, I've always been very people focused. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying learning more on the system, the technology side of things. Um, so what's next for me? I'm, I'm not sure. I think what I'd like to do is to make sure that we've got really good succession plans for our business in Asia. That's probably the most important thing and that we've got some really good young emerging leaders coming up through through the business. And so I'd like to make sure that we continue to develop them well. Um, and for myself, I'd like to um, probably uh, invest in a little bit more um, development for myself around some of those aspects of the business that I just mentioned earlier um, that I haven't really delved into in the past so much. And now they're, they're more involved in my role. Um, and I'm really enjoying that, something that I didn't see myself moving into when it came to travel in the, in the earlier years. Travel is never boring, is it? There's always never something boring. new to learn, new it's to do. It's always changing as well, definitely. Um, final question then. Imagine you're standing in front of a room full of young people who don't know what to do with their careers but are considering travel. What's the advice you would give to them? I would, I would ask them to, to kind of think about what they're naturally strong in, recognize their natural strengths, and also what gets them excited. Are they, are they excited about travel? Because travel is an industry, like all industries, it's hard work. It, it, you know, it's, it, it can be glamorous and fun and, you know, almost everybody loves the idea of travel but it is hard work and you've got to be, you know, there's a lot of amazing opportunities in the industry because it's so different than what it was when I started out 15 years ago. Um, but they have to have a level of passion for it. If they've got some natural strengths that they think would fit, whether it's in uh, systems and technology and innovation or whether it's in people and that person-to-person -person experience or program management or sales there are so many opportunities and areas to go into but they have to be fundamentally passionate or excited about the concept of travel and if they are then I would say to them absolutely go for it look at it identify the areas that you think you would naturally fit into within that business um, but if you've got a natural passion for travel as a, as, as, as a purpose, then it's a fantastic industry to go into. Um, but it's hard work, but everything is. You know, if you want to be successful in anything, you've got to put the hard work in if you want to make a difference, that is. Indeed, it, everything is hard work these days. What are, the, what are some of the basic skills that they could be developing? Um, so look, as I mentioned, you know, any, any areas of technology, um, uh, there is always going to be, you know, great opportunities out there for young people that have gone through good tech study, whether it's in IT solutions or corporate technology and systems. Um, uh, data and analytics is also another great area if that's something that they're interested in for travel. Um, you know, account management skills and sales are always areas that are going to be um, required across a lot of different businesses as well. But, um, you know, the other thing that I mentioned earlier is just that emotional intelligence, because depending on where you sit within travel, almost all of the roles are going to be uh, customer focused, whether the customers are your own internal customers within the organization because you're sitting in a support function or whether your customers are the external clients. Um, you're going to need to be dealing with people. Um, so uh, find a way to make sure that you're growing not just your technical skill set, but also your own self-awareness, your ability to communicate well with others. And by communicate, that means listen as well. Um, because if you enter into any organization and you've got a good base technical skill set um, through your studies, 
but you can show the ability to really listen and understand the questions that you're being asked and to be able to form good answers to those, then you could well be a step ahead of the other people outside the door. So don't discount the importance of really strong communication and understanding um, because that'll take you a long way in any organization. I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Um, thank you very much for your time, Vicky. And we wish you all the well, all well with your career and the coming year. Let's hope it's a little better than the last one, but travel will always be there, won't it? It will, it definitely will. And we look forward to doing a bit more of it in the near future, hopefully. Indeed. Thank you very much again, Vicky, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you.